Just for with a rocket! And that's how it's uh, almost clinch a title. Clear shines through. Hatrick beckons. And Hatrick is taken. Thank you both for joining us again. Um, good place to start would obviously be the start, so how did you choose me? Uh, it was at university. Well, I wasn't at university. I'd graduated five years previously. Uh, I'd just at Glasgow gone uni. to Glasgow Uni. And, uh, and even though Cass wasn't at Glasgow University and didn't even go to Glasgow <laughs> University, she went to Stirling. She managed to sneak her way into our, our football team <laughs> that played on a, on a Wednesday. <laughs> I still don't know so, how that um, Yeah, because you also had a full-time job and That's you managed right. to sneak away at 2 o'clock on Wednesday afternoons <laughs> to play for the university football team. Uh, we obviously won't say publicly who she worked for at that time, mm. um, but she managed to do that. So no, so we met at university football, but then Cass was also playing in the Senior Women's League. Um, I was only 17 at the time when I went to uni and, and, uh, and you'd asked me and another girl um, that was playing for the university team um, if we would we'd like to come play for, for that team in the Senior League. So. Kind of, kind of from there really is when it's it's all began. Yeah. Mm. Give us a description of each, of each other as players then. Hopeless. Hopeless. <laughs> I, I was, I, I mean, I, I've attempted <clears throat> to play football for a very for a very long time because um, I used to play at my gra- my grandfather's house with these old leather footballs from about the age of four. And but at school I wasn't allowed to play football. At secondary school I wasn't allowed to play football. I went to uni and had to fight with the sports union to get into five to put on a ladies five aside team. So the first time I actually played eleven aside football, I was twenty one years old, mm. and I'd never really coached or anything. I did train with Rose Riley for a couple of nights when I lived down in Kilmarnock for a while, but that was about it. So um, my my short football career, I would just say I was a bit of a hard worker and just loved playing basically. Yeah, I think I I would probably describe both of us as as not really been hugely talented players, but I think we we worked hard to get the best of our talent out, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I was obviously a little bit luckier being a little bit younger, uh-huh. uh, you know, nine years to be precise. But um, so I, I then thought. obviously, um, so obviously when we when we started Glasgow City, it was it was good for me because I was I was still very young and kind of had a, a career. But um, I yeah. think yeah. I think overall you maybe only played a couple of games if at all. No, Glasgow I City played nine. Oh, you played nine. Do you know how many minutes? <laughs> probably about that, probably about five and a half minutes. Yeah. <laughs> probably was that something. But how, the, how did the idea come around then? Just general chat, we, we should start a team. No, it was, it was um, a lot of factors, but yeah. the, the main one was the fact that we were um, playing in a losing team. And, and also, I, at that time, I was involved in running women's football. I was on the, the board, I was directing this what would be the SWPL now. Yeah. So um, there was a lot of things that I could see that needed changing and, and things weren't that great. We're playing, a lot of teams were playing in rubbish pitches and not wearing nice gear and all that kind of stuff. And the two of us just kind of culminated with our thoughts at the time and thought, well, why don't we just start a new team? Why don't we get good facilities, get a sponsor? Let's try and improve things and make things better yeah. and try and win. Yeah, because <laughs> obviously, um, I mean, the the team we were with, it wasn't our team. We were just two two players yeah. in the team. So I think for a lot of the fundamental changes we wanted to do, and I think at that point, I think I'd only played about one year in the senior league. We were just chatting, and we were just kind of saying, look, this can be a lot better. We would prefer a much more professional club. We'd prefer this. We'd prefer that. Well, and there comes a point where it's not. Yeah. You can't wholesale change something that's not yours. So yeah. we decided, well, let's just do it ourselves, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we did. That was the original ambition then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, what we did was we uh, we basically um, promoted our idea to a lot of what were maybe the top players in the game at that time, and we basically just invited them along to a meeting and said, you know, this is our idea. Come along, find out more about what we're about. And we went away off, and we kind of got ourselves a sponsor. We got a ground, and we told them what we wanted to do. And we invited about thirty, it was about thirty players and along. Yeah. And we did a proper presentation and put our case out there, and because it was going to be a new team, so mm-hmm. people wanted to know what it was all about. And a few people were kind of poo pooed us and kind of laughed at our ideas because we basically said we want to be the best team. We want to set up a team that's going to win, that's really going to set standards and move forward and uh, take the game to a different place. And and uh, the, pe- the people that were of a like mind said, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll yeah. be part of that. And it was great. I mean, these people are now really successful. Some of them are doing really well in the sport. You know, Wernham was um, head of coach in the Sports Scotland. Um, and, I, so they're all, and they're all really proud of their past. They're really proud yeah, of their past. Right. But I, I, think, I think for us it, it was hugely, if we hadn't have sold our 
idea at that point so well possibly we would be so successful because I think one of the reasons we started the club at that precise point in time was the way the leagues were set up was there was a, a top division, call it the Premier League if you wish, and underneath it was lots of regional leagues that all yeah. sat underneath and uh, it was only the winners of those leagues that, that managed to get promotion but there was the, the, the season we were about to start, our new team, that was the last year that was going to be that format. Then it was going to go one, two, three, and the pyramid structure would have been much harder. So we kind of thought, it's now or never. Yeah. We need to get a Premier League team into the regional division. We need to win it in one year, and we need to get up. Because after that, we'll, 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 it's it'll be really, really hard to get up. So we kind of tried to sell this ambition. We had to get Premier League players that were going to play for a year in the lower division to get us up. Yeah. And then kind of... So you know, that was where the sailing job came. We yeah. have to get into this league and win, which we did. We won every game. Yeah, it yeah. must have been a real rush. Uh, it was. It was good. I don't remember it being a bit of a rush. I just remember it being quite exciting. And yeah. you know, it was a plan. You know, plan was going into place. We went into the Premier League, and then I think we were we were third the first year in the, the league. Was that the fourth? I can't remember. No, our first year we were fifth, and then we've never not been in the top two yeah. after that. Success story then. Eh? Yeah. How did you choose the colours? Um, uh, we were really we want, yeah we wanted to touch. be we, we wanted to be nice and bright and we wanted to do something different um, and at the time Holland uh, uh -huh. were very successful and and we wanted to be vibrant because it, strips here were all I mean, it's changed now but they were they were all green reds blues yellows that that was kind of it yeah. um, and Holland was kind of out, out there as something different and something nice and bright and we thought we'll just copy that so we did so we're originally Dutch colours. We wear the kind of royal blue and tangerine. Yeah. A lot of the old kits are royal blue and tangerine. And then as time evolved... Well, they've changed as well. They're also um, orange and black now uh -huh. in the Netherlands. So they probably evolved because of the same reason as us. Because the kits that become available. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the Adidas catalogue are uh, There's a nicer no shade of orange. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how much has women's football changed in that time? Obviously it's a lot, but just how much? Massively. Oh, a huge amount. I mean, I, I think... Um, I mean, we've been going 17 years, and probably for the first six or seven of those years, maybe things didn't really change hugely. There was, we, were, we were probably just plodding along like any football team does, mm -hmm. fundraising, training, trying to win things, and it's all just very much the norm. But I, there was, was no, no team really had youth teams. Yeah. I mean, I think we have to, to understand where it was. If I tell you that when we started Glasgow City, the national team at that point wasn't even affiliated to the Scottish FA. So the girls wore tartan strips that were just made by some random company. They didn't wear the national team colours. Um, they bizarre. didn't have... And, and even when it got under the, the Scottish FA, um, you know, we'd have national team players would go away, they'd, they'd get one kit, and then when they arrived back extra at Glasgow large. Airport... <laughs> uh, extra large. When they arrived back at Glasgow Airport, they were sent to the toilets to get changed to hand all the, Scot hand all the Scotland gear back. You know, it was very kind of de demeaning to the game at that point. But considering, you know, two years before that they'd been wearing random tartan because we didn't even have a national strip, mm -hmm. um, then it had advanced. So in that respect that we've got, you know, full-time head coach, we've got development officers, we've now got, you know, a, a really organised, well-administrated league. Um, Academy Institute. Uh -huh, you yeah. know, we've got all the players' names. It's, it's massively evolved. Yeah. When did you notice it starting to change? When Anna well, Singhiel came. Neil. She was pivotal. Just that was as many to a large extent but she was pivotal in that she took us on a bus trip to Sweden she invited she got school through Sheila Begbie uh, they acquired some Leonardo, Leonardo funding uh, or Da Vinci funding I can never remember the name of it but took us to basically took us to Sweden gave us this whistle stop tour of the Swedish clubs uh, I mean it was phenomenal we just went round all the clubs they told us everything they did and basically we came back um, and said mm, we need to train more than two nights a week we're never ever going to be at a club we had to we have to improve the coaching and we mm. have to improve the training. We're never going to get anywhere if we just keep doing what we're doing. Yeah. And she was she was pivotal in doing that and she set up a financial kind of um, scheme to encourage clubs to develop that, training three nights a week and strength and conditioning. And also they set up financial through the, um, the cashback money, they set up a financial scheme there to encourage clubs also to have player pathways. Yeah. So all yeah. those things where we can have financial carrots that kind of made us, oh, right, we'll a bit of that, we'll a bit yeah. of that. So, and that's exactly what happened every year. We uh, increased the size of the club by one team. Um, one of the biggest things we did was we, we increased training to, was it three nights and then four nights and then five and then we went back down to four because that works for periodisation and things. Um, and what else did we do? We a coach. We employed a full-time coach. Yeah. And that was the biggest, the biggest thing 
biggest significant change. Yeah, there's quite a lot of milestones that Glasgow City's kind of led on in that respect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know, well, well, Cass is saying you know there was you know there was financial carnage. Yes, there was. You know, you got a thousand pounds if you did that. But us moving from two two nights a week training to to four nights cost a lot more than a thousand pounds. You know, we maybe talking about an extra eight thousand pounds it cost us. So you know, but I, I think that the difference of what Anna brought was she came in and, and very different to previous national managers who came in and were only concerned with the best 16 players that Scotland had and focused everything on them. Rosanna came in and said, well, the game's not going to develop unless the club football gets a lot better. Yeah. The teams need to train more, they need to do this. And, and she just basically showed everyone what, what happens in Sweden and said, you you, you know, you, you too can be successful, you can have this. And, um, and I think the difference probably with us, with everyone else, I would have to say, is probably we thought, yeah, can, can we actually yeah, do that? Yeah. We'll have a bit of that. And we probably went above and beyond what... What, what maybe even Anna thought maybe yeah, at the time yeah. you know in terms of what, what what we should what we should move to and what we should do but um, she was very supportive I mean she was always there saying you're doing the right thing it'll be scary and it might cost you lots of money but you know you just gave you the right encouragement thing. you needed yeah. oh, definitely, did yeah. you ever imagine you'd achieve what you have uh-huh. yes <laughs> yeah. so you always had it clear in your mind we're, we're going to we're going to be a Champions League we're going to be leading the Champions League we're yeah. going to win all these titles yeah, yeah I think it comes no surprise both, no. No, we're both um, we're both very positive people, and I yeah. think when Cass was alluding at the start when we had that presentation, I mean that in itself was very unusual because new clubs just kind of got together, and women's football was very small, and everyone knew everybody, and when new teams would form, it would just be like, I am on a new team, come on, come on, my friends, come and play for me, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas we kind of said, no, we are going to handpick who we want in our team, we're going to write to you, we're going to come, and then we're going to tell you how fantastic we are, or, or sorry, how fantastic we're going to be. And a lot of people thought, well, yeah, that's extremely arrogant and that's just absolutely ridiculous. Scotland's never going to get to that level. No team's going to get to that level. Um, but we genuinely believed if, if we did all the right things, it, it might happen. And, yeah. and obviously it has, which, is, which has been great. How do you see the game growing from now on? In Scotland or in...? I think, um, yeah, in Scotland and just more generally. Mm-hmm. Where Glasgow City will fit into that? I think it's, it's getting harder. I think the, the challenge now is probably greater than it was when we started. Um, financially, the games changed massively. Um, the women's football is becoming very much like men's football, where there's 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 quite a lot of money at, mm-hmm. at certain teams, and there's becoming quite a large gulf. Um, you know, with your Paris Saint Germains and your Wolfsburgs, etc. That you know that the gulf between them and others is is becoming you know quite almost insurmountable, to be honest. So. When you've got teams that can just, you know, do a Barcelona or Real Madrid and just buy the best players, it does become challenging. And like anything else, the more success we have, the kind of more money they get. You know, obviously the, the Frauen Bundesliga have a their their league title sponsor Allianz gives 1.1 million euros to the league, which shares amongst you know the teams in that division. I mean, we don't even have a sponsor for our league, so you know we we earn zero from winning anything or beating. And that at some point you have to accept that that's making the gap the gap grow even bigger. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's getting tough. There's also the, the in the men's game they have the compensation arrangements as well. I mean I know it's only a small thing and it might not really impact on us greatly, but just being on a par with the men's game financially would help in terms of the setup because the compensation arrangements that go you know, if you're a twenty year old player and you get signed with Barcelona, then every club you've played for up until that point gets a sheer yeah. Essentially, there's a formula, you know, that, that you get money. So or even your boys' club that you paid for when you were seven gets a share of money. Where there's no arrangement like that in women's football. So it's you know, certain players, isn't it? yeah, players that have been with us for eight, nine, ten years, they go away and sign for a German team, which is what happened. Um, not the pen. Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously, in a very successful period of time just now for Glasgow City and PSG last year, for Chelsea this year. Um, you've been to quite a we were talking about this last night, quite a lot of different places in Europe to play football. You've got to tell me some of the stories. Some of the stories, some of the weird places you've played. Oh, some of the... the worst. Serbia. The worst was Serbia the first time. We've been to Serbia twice, two extremely contrasting experiences. Um, and it was just to do with the wealth of different parts of the country. Mm. Um, and the fact they've been in a war for ten years. You know, it, you know, it's quite frightening when you land and you're travelling through and you see the deprivation that exists. Yeah. You see people living in tin shelters, etc. And we arrived, and and the hotel, um, the hotel was just not habitable, really. If we're brutally honest, I think we were all. Well, the first twelve floors certainly weren't because uh-huh. they were closed. Um, the, the 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 lift didn't work, so there was only a service lift which had no door. So you just went up and you saw the brick or the gaps, um, and the lift frequently didn't work. And as Cass says, the first 12 floors didn't work, so we were 12 floors and above. Um, so quite often the players had to walk up 13, 14, 15 flights. Um, there was no smoke alarms. 
um, in any of the rooms. All windows were full length and opened fully. And so all round. Um, <laughs> so you, it was, uh, yeah, they, they actually was a fire in the kitchen. And, uh, of course, everyone's up 15 flights. No one's got a smoke alarm. I know, it was so funny, I said, because I came back and the player, we'd just been training, the players went up in the lift and uh, I went into the restaurant and I was, like, arriving into a scene at Faulty Towers you know, with Manuel running around the restaurant with a, a dish towel, going, fire, fire, you know, and there's all the smoke everywhere. And I said, what's happened? They said, kitchen on fire, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, kitchen, why is there no fire alarm? Going, no alarm, no alarm. And I thought, shh, I'm going to have to get the girls back down in the lift. So phoning them and trying to get them so they all came back down. Because um, the girls were saying they were looking out the window because see the fire brigade arriving. I said, oh, there's going to be a fire somewhere. And, 12 floors down below you <laughs> but uh, oh, it was terrible and then the electricity got cut off uh, in that same hotel and uh, so we had no power but fortunately uh, the guy that, that was one of the sponsors of the, our team we were playing was quite high up the power the energy company so apparently we were the only place to get the power back that day in the whole town uh, so but I think you know in, in saying all that, that that was just the infrastructure of the country and the fact they'd been in a war and I mean, to be honest, there were some of the probably the nicest people we've actually ever met in football. Um, was the Serbians that, that were looking after us, and also actually they had a fantastic setup. I mean, the the women's team had its own stadium. Uh, the players were all full time. Uh, they had two businesses attached to them. They had their own printing business, and they had a, a fantastic restaurant attached to the stadium. So, you know, from as you look at that, and you look at a country that's that's really struggling financially, they've been through a war. There's a huge amount of deprivation, but the women's football clubs. You know, doing doing really really well. So these European adventures that you've had, there must have been a great learning experience in terms of running Glasgow City. Yeah, I think a lot of them have been frustrating because people seem to get so much more support from their. Um, even um, was it Finland where we we've realised that they were telling us that twelve mm. about a dozen grass pitches, of which they paid ten pounds no, a year. No, that was Denmark. Was it Denmark? They paid ten pounds a year per pitch. And they got maintained by the local council, and oh, mm. just phenomenal support from all. And a lot of people, when we tell them what we get or other don't get, they just can't believe that our, you know, our council wouldn't support us in some way. Um, yeah, we've played um, P- PK Vanta, who they have yeah. like the the town in their name, the equivalent of like Glasgow City sort of thing. You know, they get a good bumper payment every year because they carry the town's name and they carry it across Europe. And yeah. you know, it's, it's it's frustrating for us that we don't even get preferential lets in Glasgow, let alone. Finance, so yeah. yeah, but we have we've learned a lot. I mean, we've got we've had a lot of exposure to different styles of stadiums and how they all yeah. operate. And then of course the Serbia experience taught us about how they, their financial model and how they were just they, they just had a great model that was sustainable. Um, so all these little things that we've picked up in all our travels, we we kind of have a good feel for how we would like certainly our own stadium to look. Yep. And feel. Yeah, talking about facilities, you, know, you are going to build your own stadium. Yeah. How exciting the prospect is that? It's very exciting. Uh, it is very exciting. Um, uh huh. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of issues and challenges going to go along with that, but we've got the, the site um, penciled in, we've got a partnership penciled in with Eastern Bartonshire Council, um, and we've got a number of partners who have kind of indicated their interest to be part of the whole process. We've got a board set up, we've set up a charity in the name of Glasgow City Foundation, which will be the vehicle that will take all that forward. I think so. that, that that's the thing with the stadium, though. I mean, I think, obviously, everybody focuses on, oh, that will be where you'll play your football, but actually, the playing the football part is going to be about 10% of what we do there. It's all about a place for our charity to be, and that's been, that's been our biggest challenge uh, for all these years we've been running, however many that is, which is an awful lot, is that we, we've just been complete nomads. We've never trained in the same place. We've never played in the same place. We actually don't have a home. Mm. And so it's very difficult for us um, to do all the good stuff we want to do when, when we don't have a home. So having been able to base our charity in a location, in premises, is just going to be fantastic. Yeah, it falls quite nicely for the 20 years anniversary as well of the club. Yes, it will, oh, will be yeah. our 20 years, that's true. Oh, that's you get any... any Celebrations to market and, and, and mind. Oh, we're building the stadium. Build the stadium, right? <laughs> we're going to have like stuff happening. In the stadium. Yeah, we'll cut the ribbon, we'll champagne. Yeah. We'll maybe have a wee firework or two. I get get some of the old players back. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. Um, I hadn't even and thought of that actually. No, I hadn't realised that was twenty years. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. We've never really made or made a big thing about our anniversaries because we've been so blinking busy most of the time. But no, well, that's one we'll definitely have to make. Oh, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's, a good, it's a good lunch pad for the new stadium. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're really excited about it because there's, there's so many opportunities to, to do so much with that facility. As Laura says, it's not just about the football, it's about how we can interact with the community. Yeah. Okay, last question. Um, obviously, good stadium, but beyond that, where do you see the club going maybe five, ten years? 
I think we want we want to be professional. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to obviously try and, and we're looking at that just now is how we build the infrastructure to be fully professional. Yeah. Um, obviously we've got a few players that are on full time contracts. Um, but you know we want we want that to be throughout the whole team. I think mm-hmm. our challenge just now is that um, we need our, our league to kind of step up and, and kind of be at the same ambitious level as us. Mm-hmm. I think it's you know we're obviously playing Chelsea um, tonight, and you can see that they play in a very competitive um, league that is very well supported financially. Um, you know numerous high high level sponsors etc and uh, and you can see how much that's flourished English football. I mean really you go back a few years before the Super League. And I wouldn't say there was a massive gulf between Scotland and England. No, I would say there is becoming a, a quite a bit of a gulf, really. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just because of the the, the support and the, the and the infrastructure that the, the Super League's having. 